Five years ago, an 8-core CPU from Intel would easily run you over $1,000. And even though the performance was pretty kick-ass, the price was a brutal pill to swallow, effectively pricing it into the workstation market and leaving us plebs on consumer platforms to scrap over the quad-core chips instead. However, after arguably too long and a kick in the balls from AMD, we now have gaming-focused consumer chips sporting eight physical cores, with the now sub-$300 i7-9700K being one of the two consumer socket SKUs to be released going on, jeez, two and a half years ago. However, how does this chip hold up in 2021? And are eight physical cores enough to tackle 4K content creation? Alright, so in this video, we'll be taking a look at the Intel Core i7-9700K, a follow-up to the immensely popular i7-8700K, which brought forth the first spec bump to the consumer i7 line in history. While yes, 6 and 8 core i7s had existed in the years prior, they were locked behind larger and more expensive sockets. Hell, even the first generation of i7s were locked onto enthusiast LGA 1366. So by late 2018, we were foaming at the mouth to get a hold of 8-core chips on LGA 1151. And when we finally got them, we were surprised by not only the performance, but also the specs. By the time this chip released, that being October of 2018, 8-core chips were already relatively common, with Zen being introduced just over a year prior. However, mainstream 8-core offerings from Intel were still not yet available, with their consumer-focused chipsets maxing out at 6 cores and 12 threads. It was time to once again up that core count, and upon the release of the 9700K, that marked the second generation in a row where the i7 model received a core count bump. This though came at the cost of hyper-threading, meaning that for the first time since the release of the OG i7-920, an i7 processor would be shipping without this feature, leaving many to be relatively skeptical of the 9th gen offering. But putting skepticism aside, let's dig into the specs of this chip, and take a look at what's under the hood and see if we can gain another perspective. Overall, the i7-9700K is composed of 8 physical Coffee Lake R cores, and is a salvage die from an i9-9900K. This means that under the hood, the overall structure is similar, but power characteristics and overall silicon quality fall in favor of the i9, and this explains a bit that we'll get into shortly. In terms of on-die memory, we've actually got a similar cache pipeline to that found in the previous Gen 8700K. However, because each core requires its own separate L1 and L2 caches, this means you're getting a 33% increase in level 1 and 2 cache with the 9700K over the 8700K, despite both chips rocking an identical 12-lane L3 cache. In terms of core architecture, the 9700K features Coffee Lake R cores, a refresh of the 8th gen parts, meaning that like the previous 3 generations and the successive 2, these chips make use of Intel's 14 nanometer lithographic node, which despite its age, still offers excellent performance at the cost of power consumption. To put actual figures to it, my 9700K never consumed more than 128 watts when running the Intel Tuning Utility Stress Test, which puts the pedal to the metal with power draw, and in turn my Corsair H115i was able to keep it well below T-junction, usually hovering between 70 to 75 Celsius. During everyday usage though, the chip literally never exceeds 65 Celsius, only exceeding during intensive and elongated workloads, or when I want to torture the poor thing. If you're looking at a 9700K for content creation, or even as the heart of a home server, then this chip is well suited for the former, but not so much for the latter. While AVX2 is here and accounted for, other server-grade extensions such as AVX512 are absent and reserved for LGA 2066 and higher, as well as the upcoming 11th gen desktop chips. The memory controllers on board are also a bit restrictive for server use, with a maximum address capacity of 128 gigs of DDR4 and dual channel. For a more server-ready chip, I would look for a quad-channel memory controller and ECC support as well, along with chip sporting multi-threading. However, if you're looking at a 9700K as an HEDT replacement, 
Then speaking from personal experience, the 8 cores on offer are quick enough to be responsive and powerful enough to drive video editing, all the way up to modifying 4K footage in my use case. However, this brings up the hyper-threading question, leaving me wondering how much more the i9-9900K could provide in performance. But let's take a look at the performance of the 9700K, and determine if the chip is worth copying or worth dropping. Alright, so in this review I'm going to compare the results of 1080p gameplay recorded over a 10 minute gameplay session. Some of the games had their settings adjusted to reduce GPU usage, but when we get to those games I'll mention the tweaks. Specs for our machine are also as follows on screen, and remained constant between our Intel CPUs we'll be testing today. I wouldn't necessarily call our system overkill, in fact the GTX 1080 was a bottleneck in a few scenarios, but for 1080p gaming it's pretty great and I have absolutely no complaints. So starting our analysis, let's take a look at the synthetic benchmarks, and what's a better way to start than a CPU torture test? So digging into our render test, we rendered a past video codenamed CeeLo, and when rendering the roughly 14 minute video out at 4K 60fps, the 9700K was able to tackle the task in 19 minutes and 37 seconds, and when compared to our i5-9600K, we clocked in a solid 27 minute render time on the 6 core behemoth. While those scores may not seem all that impressive, keep in mind that we're rendering at 4K 60fps, meaning that every frame has 4 times the amount of pixels as a 1080p one. As a result, processing time should be quadrupled over the 1080p results, which actually clock in at similar lengths on both our i7 and i5, with our 14 minute video taking just under 8 minutes to render. For our i5, it took roughly 338% longer to render the 4K master over the 1080p one, while the 9700K was able to get that down to just around 250%. Even my render chip, a Ryzen 5 1600 AF, rendered literally a percent or two faster than the i5, so even here the i7 reigns superior to the raw threads on offer from AMD. Rather than a quadrupling of processing times, we're now only looking at roughly tripling times, giving us an idea as to how the i7 performs in a media production workflow, and based on not only the benchmark but also from some personal experience. This chip is beyond responsive, and pair it up with 32 gigs of RAM and you've got yourself a nice workstation. Moving into Cinebench R20, the i7-9700K scored an all-core of 3516, and a single core of 466, giving us an all-core scaling ratio of roughly 755%. While in a perfect world, that number should be equivalent to the number of cores on die times 100, in real-world performance, you're never going to see perfect scaling no matter how many cores you have. This is actually a planned video topic, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail in this video, and I'm going to move on to the CPU bench instead. In terms of some of the games we tested, the i7 overall performed exceptionally well, and was actually bottlenecked by our GTX 1080 on several occasions. But let's actually start off with some of the rougher performance, and probably the worst out of them all was Ark Survival Evolved. I know this game isn't known for its brilliant optimization, quite the opposite actually, but our i7-9700K in this game was actually underutilized until we lowered every setting to its lower value, restarted the game, and were greeted with this nuclear disaster. Either way, we finally pulled some benchmarking from it, and although the performance of the game falls short in several areas, the game overall was very playable, and it wasn't necessarily the fault of our hardware, which is why I'm doing my best to preface this with the necessary information. Black Ops Cold War also performed relatively poorly until graphic settings were dropped, but once they were set to low, the game was beyond playable, and I enjoyed the 1980s vibes in the relative comfort of 144Hz plus gameplay. Warzone also ran relatively well on all of our chips, however I did want to note that gameplay felt much smoother than Black Ops Cold War, which had overall higher frame rates, but honestly felt pretty horrible to play, until I locked the FPS to 60. In CSGO, a notorious Intel favorite, the i7-9700K curb stomped both our i5 and Ryzen 5, and looking at other CPU intensive games, specifically Grand Theft Auto V and PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, all had very tangible improvements brought upon them by upgrading to the 9700K, 
However, when looking at other games, this trend continues, and if our benchmarks are anything to go by, it's that this little piece of silicon and fiberglass is fast. Really fast. But for the price you would pay to get your hands on one of these, which I found for 290 USD on Amazon, is it worth the money when AMD offers very, very competitive chips? Well, yes and also kinda no. If you're looking to build a solely gaming focused machine, then the Intel Core i7-9700K is a gaming beast of a chip, and curb stomps similarly priced and even more expensive Ryzen 5s with less threads and more cores. However, if you're doing anything else, such as video or image editing, while the 9700K proves to be competent, you'll see the biggest gains in these applications with hyperthreading, leaning me to want to give a recommendation of a 10th gen chip or even a Ryzen 7. It's interesting because in a few years, we'll look back on the 9700K and see it as a relic of a weird time in Intel's history. They weren't necessarily slipping, but their dominant market position was definitely being challenged, and as a result, they were sort of forced to sell their HEDT parts on their consumer platforms just to stay competitive. It's an artifact that's interesting to use on my part, but even more interesting to analyze. And I can't wait to take another inevitable look at this chip when we discuss budget CPUs in just a few short years.